You wander around on YouTube and you find yourself listening to The Book Was Better. This week, we are reviewing One Man's Rough Week in 1980s Manhattan. Here are five things you will love about Bright Lights Big City. This is the story of a man's struggle with addiction and denial over the course of a week in New York. He's a fact checker for a magazine and could care less about his job and has long abandoned his aspirations of becoming a writer. He wanders Manhattan with a friend going from this party to the next and having superficial conversations with superficial people. But the clubbing nomads share one thing in common and that leads us to number one. The Bolivian Marching Soldiers. The main character has an addiction, and he and his friend take what they refer to as Bolivian marching powder. Your brain at this moment is composed of brigades of tiny Bolivian soldiers. They are tired and muddy from the long march through the night. There are holes in their boots and they are hungry. They need to be fed. They need the Bolivian marching powder. He supplements cocaine with vodka. Vodka numbs him to the world and cocaine keeps him awake for it. They start at clubs and maybe end up at loft parties. His friend, Tad Allagash, has one rule, and that's at the party must must always be moving forward. You started on the Upper East Side with champagne and unlimited prospects, strictly observing the Allagash rule of perpetual motion, one drink per stop. Tad's mission in life was to have more fun than anyone else in New York City, and this involves a lot of moving around, since there is always the likelihood that where you aren't is more fun than where you are. You are awed by this strict refusal to acknowledge any goal higher than the pursuit of pleasure. You want to be like that. I'm a recovering Manhattanite myself, and remember the days of clubbing and always looking for the next party. Although my of choice was Mandarin Vodka on the rocks. You always need a good partner in crime. And that leads us to number two, Tad Allagash. Let's talk a minute about the character of Tad Allagash. Tad is a friend who supplies him with cocaine, and that leads him to an unlimited supply of women to have meaningless conversations and the possibilities of sex. Towards the beginning, he describes their dates as the sexual equivalent of fast food. Now, as good jockeys of our moral high horses, we are supposed to view the Tad Allagashes of the world as bad people. Enablers is what we call them. The main character should seek help for his addiction and stay away from people like Tad. But on the other hand, I'm a bit more understanding. Nobody who suffers from addiction ever seeks help right off the bat. The main character's suffering stems from his supermodel wife, Amanda, leaving him. After a bad breakup, we all need a friend like Tad to drink with and help us wallow in our sorrows. His friend Tad is a great wingman. He's happy to tell potential dates that his wife, Amanda, died of a terminal disease and the main character doesn't put up much effort to deflect that since it's a lot more sympathetic for the women they are trying to land. His friend gives him exactly what he needs right now. Two of the things you like about Allagash is that he never asks you how you are, and he never waits for you to answer his questions. You used to dislike this, but when the news is all bad, it's a relief that someone doesn't want to hear it. Now you just want to stay on the surface of things, and Tad is a figure skater who never considers the sharks under the ice. And Tad's not afraid to tell him what he thinks of his ex-wife. Weren't you suspicious when you saw that sign on her forehead? Which sign was that? The one that said, Space to Let, Long and Short Term Leasing. Also, when the main character loses his job at the magazine, Tad is happy to help him exact revenge by purchasing a ferret from a street vendor and letting it loose in the office. We all need a friend like Tad Allagash to help us through a bad breakup and support us in our unhealthy ways of dealing with it. I mean, if I lost my job and a friend helped me acquire and release a ferret in the office as revenge, in my book, that friend is a keeper. Eventually, he runs into Amanda at a party and she's with another guy. She seems pretty cold as she treats her ex-husband as though he's a mild acquaintance whose name she's trying to remember. I myself dated a model during my New York days who was a bit of an ice queen. I gotta say, I think if I ran into her, she probably wouldn't remember my name either. So this scene hit a little close to home for me. The character's life was thrown into shambles because of his breakup, but for Amanda, it was Tuesday. This book gives you a real sense of perspective of the main character's viewpoint, and that leads us to number three, the point of view. You can't have a book review of Bright Lights without talking about the point of view. It's told in the second person, which is pretty rare for most literature. How rare well, if you Google the examples of second-person books, I guarantee you that every list will include this book. It's probably the most famous example. This has turned some people off as second-person can be perceived as intrusive by the reader. When the cocaine-induced feelings are described, you, the reader, are really put in the driver's seat. Tad lays out some fat lines on the toilet. Elaine and Teresa take their turns. Finally, Tad hands you the bill. The sweet nasal burn hits like a swallow of cold beer on a hot dogist day. Tad fixes another round, and by the time you all troop out of the bathroom, you are feeling omnipotent. You are upwardly mobile. Everyone knows everyone else. You are on the anticline of your first rush. You are also experiencing the inevitable disappointment of clubs. You enter with an anticipation that on the basis of past experience is entirely unjustified. You always seem to forget that 
that you don't really like to dance. Since you are already here, though, you owe it to yourself to make a substantial assault on the citadel of good times. The music pumps you up, makes you want to do something, not necessarily dance. The drugs make you feel the music, and the music makes you want to do more drugs. It's understandable that some readers might be turned off by this style, since it makes you, the reader, feel like you're an addict, but I enjoyed it. If you want to give me an out-of-body experience with your book, I'll gladly take that over the timid third person. Even the speaker attributes are written as you said. But this story isn't just wall-to-wall -wall drug and opiate-induced ramblings. A backstory emerges, and we learn about the main character. I keep saying main character because in the movie his name is Jamie, but in the book he's actually unnamed. We learn that he was married to Amanda briefly and she dumped him. Badly. As they move to New York from a small Midwestern town, the main character's ambitions to become a writer quickly fade, and Amanda finds overnight success as a runway model. She is flown off to Paris where she divorces the main character over the phone. We only get one side of the story, but that does seem like an indefensible way to break up. It gives us good context as to why this character ended up like this and why he's fallen into addiction. On the surface, the divorce is the character's drive, but an even deeper drive develops, and that leads us to number four, the coma baby. As the week trudges on, the main character follows a story in the post about a pregnant woman who is in a coma and may very well not make it out. Her unborn is referred to in the post as the coma baby. The main character dreams of the coma baby still in the womb talking to him. He opens his eyes and looks at you. What do you want? He says. Are you gonna come out? You ask. No way, Jose. I like it in here. Everything I need is pumped in. But mom's on her way out. If the old lady goes, I'm going with her. The side plot of the coma baby mirrors the main character's own dilemma, which is central to the story arc. He suffered a traumatic experience with his mother when she died from cancer. She was adamant about not taking drugs since she wanted to be coherent in her final days, and the main character watched as she slowly died in pain. Through the coma baby headlines, we realize that the main character might very well be in his own sort of womb. He might be experiencing one of the Kubler-Ross stages of grief, known as denial, and through cocaine, alcohol, and superficial relationships, he's existing in his own version of a protected womb and like the coma baby refusing to be delivered to reality. He even admits later that he married Amanda maybe because it would make his mother happy. The omnibus presence of the New York Post headline throughout the week taunt the main character in his journey through the club scene and adds a layer of complexity to the story. But the story isn't all depression and addiction and that leads us to the fifth thing you will love. This book is wickedly funny. I love this style of writing where characters have facetious views of the world and aren't afraid to let us know exactly what they're thinking. Check out my reviews of Catcher in the Rye and Bonfire of the Vanities. All three of these books feature a lot of description of New Yorkers by New Yorkers. There's nothing like dry wit mixed with cynicism, and books that take place at New York are the best at this. The main character always has something to say about his ex-wife, his friend Tad, his co-workers, his boss, and of course the club scene. Everyone here has the Jordache look, the look that you don't want to know better. Hundreds of dollars worth of cosmetics on the women, and thousands in gold around the necks of the open-shirted men. Gold crucifixes, stars of David, and coke spoons hanging from the chains. Some trust in God to get them laid, others in drugs. Someone should do a survey of success ratios, publish it in New York Magazine. And go ahead and Google coke spoon necklaces. I guess people in the 80s used to just waltz into parties with one of these things dangling around their neck to let you know they're ready for a good time. The book is full of musings about Manhattan in the 80s. If you love all things 80s, you will love this book. This is the story of a man who is in denial, and it all culminates in one stressful week. We end on a high note where the character looks out at the horizon of a new day and have hopes that he might finally be delivered into an attitude of acceptance and move forward and maybe even shake his addiction. I enjoyed this book which really put me back in the vortex of the greatest city in the world and at 180 pages it's a pretty fast read. That's it for this week. Coming up I'm reviewing Orwell's 1984, Dashiell Hammett's The Thin Man, and Vengeance, the book that Spielberg's Munich is based on. Check out my own book Grand Portage about a man and his aircraft carrier available on Amazon in paperback or Kindle. Thanks for watching and never stop reading.